Go faster. Thanks for the input, but I don't know if I can. Then why are we using this thing? Why didn't you mention that they hang out by the cliffs? I forgot. You forgot? All right, fine. I didn't know. I'm used to seeing these things far in the distance, not this close. If we live, let's have a conversation about what you can and can't help me with. Turn that crank between your feet. Joff found the crank and lifted the base up, clicking it into place. The mechanism squeaked as it turned. Two of the canisters causing the vehicle to float were pushed outwards on poles as Joff cranked. Are you buckled? What? We're about to be killed. Who cares? Either buckle up or hold on. Jeff's trembling hands made it difficult, but he strapped himself in. Ready? Ready. Beakmask pulled two levers all the way to the right. The vehicle tilted and shot them to the side just as the Colossal reached for them. The vehicle kept turning to the right, moving them faster, and then kept tilting. Wait, wait, wait! Too much! They were spinning end over end. Joff soon forgot which way was up. The straps holding him began to tear as the force of the spin tried pulling him out. This had better not have been on purpose. Beakmask was scrambling with the controls. Some combination of lever pulls slowed the spin, putting them right side up, just in time to collide with the ground. The vehicle bounced and skidded along towards a ravine. The Colossal stomped at the spot that they had hit, the impact causing another bounce. They slid off into the ravine, some of the capsules clipping the edge. After falling another 60 feet, Big Mask stabilized it again. He pushed a few levers and the front tilted down, propelling them forward. Joff turned to look up and behind them. We have to go lower. I can't. Something's jammed. The Colossal's massive arm reached for them, even as far down as they were. Big Mask pulled out the two levers to his left, this time not going quite as far, dodging the hand. What do I do? We can't keep this up. Bring the capsules in. Turn the crank the other way. Joff turned the vehicle with all his might. The vehicle lurched again the other way, avoiding another reach. All right, done. See that green lever? Yeah! Joff yanked on a lever next to his leg. His stomach lurched into his throat as the vehicle dropped like a rock. Joff felt an odd peace with his imminent death, which was unusual for him. No use freaking out. This was it, either way. The blue button, next to the green lever. What? He could barely hear him over the sound of the wind. Push the blue button! Joff found it, and the vehicle jolted. Parachutes released and unfolded, slowing them down, but not enough. They hit the ground a few moments later, bouncing a few times before colliding with the ravine wall and coming to a stop. It was a weird sensation, death seeming so sure, but not visiting after all. All they did was breathe for what seemed like an hour, but was probably closer to a minute. I didn't tell you to pull the green lever. Then why did you mention it? To direct you to the much smaller blue button. What? How about you start with that next time? Well, at this rate, there won't be a next time because you'll get us both killed by then. So this is my fault because you said the green lever instead of the blue button. The correct answer would have been, yes, Mr. Beakmask, sir, I see the green lever. As we're about to be eaten, give me a break. Well, hey, you're less nervous now, at least. <sighs> That's because you're driving me crazy. I guess we'll just have to take turns at that this trip. All right, did we lose the maps? No, but they're kind of crumpled for me holding on to them too tight. Good. How do you feel? Sore and bruised, but I can walk. Then let's get this gear off this thing. After separating all of the various boxes, Beakmask began dismantling the vehicle. He kept the floating devices that were still functional and stripped out the mechanisms that opened and closed them. Meanwhile, Joff tracked down the correct map, figured out where they were and which way they needed to go. The spot wasn't far from this part of the cliffs to begin with. The hike from here should only be six miles or so, but Joff hated hiking. Ready? He looked up from marking up the map to see the contraption Beak Mask had built. The boxes were now hanging under the remaining capsules, levitating a few feet off the ground. He tossed Joff the end of a rope and grabbed the other one for himself. They pulled the gear like a pair of horses, but luckily there wasn't much resistance. The walk wasn't too bad until the sun began to reach the bottom beating down on them like a heavy weight and slowing them down significantly. Must be around noon. The ravine floor eventually split, one natural path continuing at the same elevation that they were, scraping along the cliff wall, the other path dropping further and further into the earth, to the point where Joff couldn't see the bottom anymore. After another hour of pulling the boxes, the slim path broadened. Here was a large overhanging cave, with what must have been a door at the furthest point in. They kept pulling the gear into the cave, the map was true to its word. This looked like the place, or at least the entrance to the place. Let's keep the capsules floating. This could take minutes or hours. Why is that? Most of these kind of places are one huge collection of puzzles, 
starting with the door. How would that be any better than a key? If we have a chance of solving it, wouldn't many other people have a chance to? I would guess most people wouldn't spend hours trying to figure this out, especially if they think it requires a key. Besides, a key could be stolen easily. Let's take a look. The first thing that stuck out to the pair was the row of thick metal boxes, four on each side, boxes with the right side cut off. Upon further inspection, the side facing the wall seemed to have a metal rod, or at least a rod capped with metal, going into the stone wall in and upwards at a 45 degree angle or so. Are all of them like this? Seems that way. Could explosives work? How so? I mean, if these metal rods need to be pushed in, couldn't an explosion set in those boxes do that? What makes you think I brought explosives? I would actually be surprised if you didn't have an entire one of those boxes just for explosives. So, I suppose I'm just guessing. Good guess. Let's try it out on one of them first. Beak Mask opened a side door to an orange box using a key Joff hadn't noticed before. It produced another box, long and narrow, like it could have been a case for a short sword. Inside were black cubes that were double stacked. Joff counted 12. He set down the container and took one of the cubes out and turned one of the sides with a click. Big Mask removed the panel and set the cube into the box attached to the wall. He handed Joff a device that resembled a mouth harp. This will produce a sound that will cause the contraption inside the cube to vibrate, triggering the explosion. Whenever you're ready. Big Mask turned to walk about 50 feet away from the box, along the wall, and Joff followed. Joff pulled back and released the metal prong, producing an odd tone. After a few seconds, a loud explosion erupted from the cube, bigger and louder than Joff would have thought possible from such a small device. The metal rod had disappeared into the wall, only to reappear moments later. My guess would be it's meant to touch some kind of pressure plate on the other side. Joff nodded. Maybe triggering them all in the same time is what we need to do. Sounds like a plan. The two set to arming eight more devices, setting one in each slot on the wall. As soon as Joff set the last cube in place, the earth below him shook with the impact of something large hitting the ground. They turned to see a desert ruby standing at the cliff's edge, with a cluster of people on its back. A second one landed next to the first. Maybe they're trying to rescue us. Let's avoid being naive, please. The two rubies approached, each standing over 20 feet tall, the riders dismounting as they walked. Joff counted 21 people, some of his kind, many humans, and others that wore scarves, making it difficult to tell what they were. Beak Mask took a few steps towards them. Good afternoon, or good evening. I'm not really sure which. I hope it continues to be a good one, but that's up to all of you. One of the men approached with several others trailing behind, leaving a gap of 30 feet between the two parties. Correct me if I'm wrong, because maybe I am, but it doesn't look like you're in the position to be threatening anyone right now. Well, if that's the case, then what are you waiting for? We'd like for you to open this door so we don't have to trouble our little brains about it. If I could open it, we would be inside right now. Oh dear, how tragic. Don't make me beg. I hate begging. Big Mask sighed. We've been trying to open it, but I have to admit... This door has me stumped. I was told you are supposed to be a smart guy. Oh, I definitely am. It's just that my conclusion so far is that brute force is what this door needs. Well, good thing we have these beautiful creatures right here with us. My thoughts exactly. You must be a fellow smart guy. I like to think so, yes. The man whistled, and the two remaining rioters led the beast to the door. One moment, sir, before they let us in. Beakmask's hand opened behind his back. Joff, now shaking again, set the trigger device into his hand. I have to ask, how did you avoid that colossal? Oh, that. Well, those monstrosities hate interacting with desert rubies as a general rule if they can help it. Very hard for them to get rid of one once they latch on. How fascinating. The devices went off, all eight at the same time. The earth rumbled and chunks of rock fell from the cave ceiling. Joff's ears were ringing and the two beasts at the door lay next to each other, unconscious, totally concussed. He figured the two riders must be dead. When the 19 remaining bandits recovered, the sound of metal sliding across metal filled the cave. The door began to slide down into the rock floor. Well, after that, we can't let you escape with quick deaths, unfortunately. The problem with that is that you'll need us. And the floor you're standing on is set with more explosives. The bandits jumped and searched around the ground they were standing on. Quit bluffing. The door's open, and we're going in. And we're getting what's inside. You won't make it much further than this door. This vault will kill all of you if you don't use my experience and massive brain to get around all the traps. Very well. In that case, lead the way, Mr. Beakmask. Beakmask cocked his head to the side. By the way, how did you know to follow us here? How could you have known who I was? 
At this question, a hooded figure approached, standing between the two sides. Joff thought he might be the strangest person he had ever seen. He almost looked like a cross between a rabbit and a catfish, with plates of armor and a staff in his hand. It's nice to see you again. I thought these guys could use some help. For a price, of course. Beak Mask sighed. Oh, come on, Volk. 